Hey, fellow conspiracy realist, we're doing an episode on cults today. This is a classic episode where uh, Matt, as you recall, off air, I probably said this with great regret. I had to admit there was a bad Ben. Ben Tino? Yes. Yes. Bentino Massaro uh, is to some um, a thought leader, to some a prophet, to supporters. It's a person who has changed their lives. To critics, uh, this is a bad Ben. Uh, has been accused of cultic practices, has been accused of some untoward behavior. And we really dig into this in, in our episode. Uh, just heads up, everyone. Uh, a lot of stuff has happened in the intervening years with Masara's movement. Uh, and we wanted to learn more about it. So when you hear this, you're hearing the information we have at the time. You're also hearing a hopefully helpful conversation about what defines a cult and I don't know, Matt, what what do you remember from this one? What really stuck out to you? Well, I remember signing up for Bentino's newsletter and never turning back. Ah, he got you. All right. Well, here's huh? the show. <laughs> from UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. I'm an expression of the Infinite One Creator in Sixth Density. Do you do you have a name? That's it. Oh, I, I felt like you left off with an ellipsis, like you were going to give me more, like some sort of uh, celestial title. Do I'm you just introducing myself. Do you want to be the movement formerly known as Matt? Or the vibration formerly known as Matt? I am an expression of the Infinite One Creator in Sixth Density. Okay, I'll take it. I'm still Noel. I'm Nam Shabai, folks. They call me Ben. You are you. We're joined with our super producer, Paul Deccant. That makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Welcome to the show. As you can tell, uh, since we last all got together, there have been a few changes. Mm -hmm. Spiritual changes, vibrational changes. Yeah, Matt is basically just this kind of like neutron cloud that's just slowly filling up the studio. And he, he does still have a mouth. Yes. Thankfully. So I'm an expression of infinity. So, you know, right now, what he's reminding me of, Noel, is the uh, the gaseous creature in that Rick and Morty episode called Fart, voiced by Flight of the Concords actor. Mm. Similar. Similar. Well, thank you for uh, coalescing into a physicalish form. Could somebody open a window? I don't want to lose him. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here for as long as the podcast is. What is time? Hopefully we have enough time uh, before you ascend to higher planes, Matt, uh, to journey into a very interesting rabbit hole, which, Noel, uh, you were the one who showed us, introduced us to this guy off air when we first learned about this fairly recently, right? A few weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a Medium article that was making the rounds online, and a, and a friend of mine actually sent it to me um, as a potential topic for the show. And... More so than talking specifically about this one individual who we will get to, it kind of opened the door to talk a little bit more about cults in the digital age, right? Exactly. We have talked about cults before, both in these broad structural terms and through more specific examples, such as the ants uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, the Jonestown Massacre with Jim Jones, and many more. And although it's a little by the book, let's start with the biggest, most obvious question, how do we define Cult. And for that, we head on over to Merriam-Webster, which defines cult as a religion regarded as unorthodox or spurious. It's also uh, it's referring to the body of adherence to uh, said movement. And it also defines it as great devotion to a person, idea, object, movement or work, such as a film or a book. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a cult film, a cult classic being something that has a small but incredibly loyal following often for being trash. Yes. Um or cult of personality, you know, which 
can also refer to a cult leader. My problem with these definitions, you guys, though, is that to me, th- this is what religion is, right? Like it's it's a it's a some one person's unorthodox belief is another person's faith. So wh- right. where's the distinction, right? Right. So, for instance, to the Pope, while many other religions would have value, uh, they all are unorthodox or at the very least erroneous if they are not Catholicism as practiced by the Catholic Church. Yeah, and if you're an Orthodox Jew, everyone else is completely unorthodox, right? Right, right. And uh, maybe just has a short attention span, right? That's how one rabbi explained it to me. Uh, we see two different approaches here in the definitions with some overlap between them. And I appreciate you raising the point that we wanted to make here about cult. The idea of what makes a cult is the idea of what makes something beautiful. It's very similar. It's in the eye of the beholder, and it's a subjective thing. At the very most basic first density level, a cult is just a group of people worshiping something, and they almost never, outside of pop culture, describe themselves as a cult. It's a tricky term. It's usually regarded as an insult. If our super producer Paul Deccant started what he felt was a religious movement and we started referring to it as Paul's cult, Paul and his followers would be probably offended. Yeah. Paul, Paul's nodding in a way that makes me think I may have already crossed the line. Well, yeah, because – Paul's journey is the way, the light, and the truth for me as a follower of Paul's journey. How many cults are you in, bro? All of them. Uh, yeah, funny story. We, Matt and I, in an earlier video audio series, we delineated the commonalities between cults and the ways in which these things function, if mm-hmm. you think of them as an engine. And we – We taught people how to start one. We taught people how to start one. That was a little controversial. That was in the same era when we had a video describing how people get away with murder, mm. which is still up if yeah, you want to see it. we should probably – we should probably take a look at that again. But despite the slippery slopiness of that word cult, we are making a, a conscious choice, an editorial choice to use that word today. Right, Ben? Yeah, exactly. For the purposes of today's episode, we are going to use the word cult and we're going to use it to describe organizations that share some of these commonalities from our earlier videos and some we'll explore today. And we're also using it more as shorthand mm-hmm. rather than an insult because it, it goes back to that that point we're underlining here we're emphasizing one person's cult is another person's real religion and the point of this show has never been to tell people what to believe but the reason we're choosing to use the word cult is because today's overall question is how do cults exist in the digital world are these organizations these movements adapting are the lines between a fandom and a legit actual cult blurring? And if so, how? First, we have to look at the facts. The world is chock full of self-described movements, intentional communities, spiritual institutions, and on and on and on. And often, mainstream culture, huh? Culture? Mm. Interesting etymology there. Only hears of these fringe movements when something goes horrifically, catastrophically wrong, such as the destruction of the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, the Alm Shinriko terrorism in Japan, or, of course, the Jonestown massacre. But, as we know, you know, the, the bloody headlines sell the best, right? And there's a motivation in most media to only show you the bad news. This does not jibe with the reality of the situation, which is this. Around the planet, probably in your home country, maybe even in your own neighborhood as we record this, these sorts of movements are much less uncommon than you might think. Maybe not cartoonishly common or ubiquitous, but they're definitely out there, and often they're harmless. They're Mm -hmm. a group of people who have all decided to get severely on the same page <laughs> about something whether it's a diet right we see a lot of we see a lot of people organized by their diet or by mm-hmm. their environmental beliefs right you'll even see the c word applied to certain uh, workout regimens and groups getting together uh having you know working out at a gym mhm uh, you'll see it applied to a lot of different things. Somebody said, how can we be both fit and cross? <laughs> yes. 
So uh, in the in the days before the digital era, um, as as we have examined before, these groups would typically be isolated. They would tend to self-isolate. They would be isolated by a leader who sought, unfortunately and often inevitably, to gain complete control of the group or community by eliminating any other source of information. It's one of the most common things about cults. And yeah. we, we can talk a little bit about some of these commonalities. Well, yeah, you can imagine it, especially if you go back just before the advent of the Internet. If you didn't have a machine that you could access in your home that had all of the information out there and you only had the books, the physical books that are available, the telephone that you can make a, you know, a call and only one person can really use a phone at a time in that way, um, it, you realize how much information control existed. And we do know that the cognitive an emotional isolation of followers is very important to starting and maintaining a cult. Um, like if you're in one, you can't read unapproved books. Um, you can't watch unapproved shows. You can't really communicate much with your family because maybe your family is encouraging you to not be in this cult anymore. Um, you can't speak with those relatives. And, you know, it just moves on and on and on. And that's one of the primary goals of a cult leader. It's It's to isolate. Not only isolate, but break people down psychologically mm -hmm. uh, by instilling in them this notion that nothing they do is good enough or they can't actually, you know, better themselves without the direct input and influence of the person that is uh, kind of setting themselves up as being the cult leader. And then you have sexual control as well. Yeah, typically – this and this is common, the cult leader will eventually have some sort of divine revelation, whether they see themselves as that divinity or see themselves as a messenger of that divinity. And the realization will be that either no one can have sex, that he or she, the cult leader, can be the only person who has sex with anyone, or that the followers must obey the sexual dictates of the leader. That's where you hear about someone saying, it has come to me through whatever mm -hmm. my brand name of God is that person A is the spiritual spouse of person B. And that's the only people that – these are the only people that can fool around now to the next like, With David Koresh, for example, he received visions, uh, one of which told him that the sister of one of his wives was to be his new wife and everyone else, the males in that cult, were celibate. Yep. Yeah, and it never really starts that way. No, no. I mean, that's – it's salesmanship 101. You get your foot in the door and what what happens with this – I know it's lurid and it seems it, – it's incredibly gross. I really appreciate, Noel, you mentioning the David Koresh example because I believe that sister may have been underage at the time. Is that correct? I do believe so, yes. So in Koresh's – Bible studies, which were these 10 hour, 10 to 16 hour performances of him just yelling at people in, in those things, he would, he would constantly and, and, um, increasingly make them of a sexual nature and find Bible verses where he would interpret this as, you know, this, passage of the Bible says this. What's he really saying? He's saying that the women want dicks. And pardon the crudeness here. This is a quote. He would say, what do, What does this Bible verse mean? It means they want big dicks. Everybody say it. And he would make people say it. And to us on the outside, that sounds insane. But this is after, this is after how many days of how many solid hours being yelled at, having your personal life controlled, having, and this is one of the most important parts, having your ego erased, the obliteration of the I. And this this occurs in a lot of organizations. Militaries attempt to erase the ego. And you'll hear people say sometimes that they had a friend who entered into a very intense branch of the military or something and that they came out changed, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, maybe just different. Um, cults actively, like in our earlier stuff with the Charles Manson family, Cults actively obliterate the agency of the followers, which is why it is so important to us. A cult is – a podcast is not and should not be a cult, but that's why it's so important to us that you listening, specifically you, 
still get to be yourself and make your own decisions. We're not going to yell at you. Yeah. Yeah, you be you. Don't don't listen to what we're saying. Don't follow every word. Says the cloud. Yeah, seriously, <laughs> dude. You're, I'm starting to doubt your credibility on <laughs> these issues. Um, but let's just rattle off a few other destructive patterns that cults um, operate under so we can get into the, the, the juice of today's episode. Yeah, let's do a worst-case scenario. Yeah, so we've got leaders who emotionally exploit the vulnerable, and oftentimes the folks that flock to these types of leaders are very vulnerable. They're seeking answers, and often they uh, are attracted to strong personalities, who cult leaders typically are. Um, eventually, as Ben said, things change and take can take a dark turn as that exploitation goes from emotional to physical. Uh, and then we have leaders who start to obliterate the ego, like Ben said, through social pressure, uh, physical abuse, shaming people, putting their business out in public, having people judge them, completely wearing them down to the point where they can be molded in the image or in, you know, at the discretion of the leader. And then the next one is important for today's discussion. The leader's rambling word salad becomes the primary narrative of the group. And then the group's narrative, after all this rambling, starts to turn dark, sometimes violent and often often self-destructive, as this leader is seeking to increasingly say things that are shocking or something that it will be new and incredible for their followers to grasp onto, things to do even. Um, and they need to maintain this this unpredictability mm-hmm. or, or be viewed as unpredictable and maintain control of all these people listening. Yes, that's important because you have to be providing revelations, right? And no one can ever be good enough. Your authority cannot be challenged. So this unpredictability, this increasing escalation of shocking behavior is a, an important tool, a crucial tool for maintaining control. And that's when, again, um, in the worst case scenarios, we see situations involving suicides, or murders, or other horrendous crimes. Now we enter the digital age. If isolation is a key to the formation, growth, and ultimate decay of cults, surely the glut of information available via phone or text or tablet or social media would reduce cults. You're always in contact with someone, right? You'd think, but it might not be. Let's hear a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. There are digitally powered movements forming today and growing successfully that fit, according to their critics, a lot of the definitions of a cult. And this is where we arrive at uh, the story that no, your friend introduced us to, a character named Bentinho Massaro. You may have also heard him called Bentinho. Yeah, so I was turned on to an article um, on Medium that came out in December of last year by a uh, a writer by the name of B B E Schofield, um, who alleges that Massaro is a cult leader, empowered by the um, ever evolving nature of digital communications. In fact, the um, headline of the article is the very salacious tech bro guru inside the Sedona cult of Bentinho Massaro. And and the top of it is uh, is emblazoned with some pictures from this man's Instagram account, one where he's dressed up as Hugh Hefner with like a captain's hat on surrounded by scantily clad Playboy Bunny-esque women. And I like the Joker one, one. There's one where he's like the, the real bad Joker from... Uh, uh, the, the latest Batman movie with uh, what's his face? Jared, Jared Leto, Leto yeah. Suicide Squad Joker. Do, do, doing a mirror selfie. And then there's one where he's uh, got a cigar in his mouth. In the background, you see some real real fancy scotches. Um, but who is this guy? And, and, and what's he after? What does it mean to be a tech bro cult leader? <laughs> well, uh, he started, well, at least from what we can tell, he started posting on a YouTube channel in 2010. And... Uh, this is just what we know from the surface, and we'll get into what we know after some research. On the surface, first video, understanding life is impossible. And uh, here, here are just some ideas from that video. We as human beings 
Every situation we encounter, we constantly try to analyze. We constantly try to understand everything. In reality, the life that's just here, it cannot be understood. We have to stop trying to understand everything. Life wasn't meant to be understood. It's the embrace of the mystery that instantaneously reveals the beauty of what's right here. The funny thing is, when we stop trying to understand what we perceive, we naturally understand in here. At that point, he points at his chest. Thinking is just another aspect of reality, and it cannot understand itself. Life doesn't care why it's here. It's simply here. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, overall, that sounds like, first off, a restatement of things that have been said pretty often. And uh, do people understand life? I mean, it's a it's a fair question. And and just to say in the video, he appears to be a young man. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, was it around seven, eight years ago, you said? Yeah, 2010. Um, You know, just a young man giving his beliefs into a laptop computer. Sort of a manifesto, right? And these these uh, selfie manifestos are super common on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Literally anyone with an Internet connection and a camera can make a YouTube account or make a Google account and post them. Personal spirituality is nothing new to YouTube. And you might not be familiar with this guy, although he is a YouTube sensation. He's built a massive following uh, since that video in 2010. Uh, we have stats for you. His Facebook page has over 300,000 uh, people on it. His Instagram is over 20,000. They've got Facebook groups that follow him. His YouTube videos have over 2 million views. I think that's total, mm-hmm. not per video. Yeah, yeah, no, for no, sure. No. I mean, his videos individually, he, he's got a ton of them. Mm. They're in the thirty to 40,000 views apiece. And, and I would argue these numbers are not earth-shattering by any means. But where it gets interesting is when you start to see the kind of money he's able to bring in with this semi-modest following, right? He has an organization called the Trinfinity Academy. It's a website, um, sort of a self-help kind of guru type website and on it you can read these courses that he has laid out and it's got kind of like a radiohead pay what you will model uh but apparently according to um the medium article he brings in around sixty thousand dollars a month which is more than enough to cover the fourteen thousand dollar a month rent for his lavish offices in sedona arizona which is is his home base um and ben you th- said earlier you felt like that 60,000 wasn't all donations but that could account for um people that are paying to come to his uh, seminars. Well, you know Noel, they do they suggest at the very bottom on the left-hand side of the page, they suggest that if you're going to take one of their uh one of their courses on their website, they suggest a 100 to a $300 donation per per one that you're going to read. Right on. Sure. But, I mean, you know, that would, that's sort of like a, what's a, the honor system kind of situation. Mm-hmm. It's like when you go to the Met Museum in New York and they say recommended donation of, of $30. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I usually give 10, but is I'm, it, I'm a cheapskate. Is it 30? I thought it was 20. Is it 20? I think they might okay. be. Well, I know they're actually, not to get too off topic, but the Met is actually going to start imposing an actual ticket price very soon. Yeah. So probably a good idea. Get in there while you can. Yeah. Well, and, but this isn't their only source of income, uh, these online courses. Right, yeah. Uh, Masaru also has in-person retreats that gather crowds of uh, up to hundreds. And when we were talking off air, that was that was one of the things that perked our collective ears up, because it seems like if you're going on honor system of suggested donations, sixty thousand a month seems like a really tall milkshake for that. But if people are booking the seminars through that, does that count the income as well? And we also have to ask, we will ask later, just to be fair, uh, the motivations of B. Schofield, uh, the writer, who did a fantastic job with this article, by the way. So back to the digital age. Masaru has effectively used things like WhatsApp or Facebook Live to, to reach new followers. And although, you know, although as Noel pointed out, these are not especially earth shattering numbers. It's not like the, um, you know, a musician with billions of views or something doing this, reaching this level of success independently is pretty impressive. It's still 
small time in comparison to some other spiritual movements. And again, let's keep in mind, spiritual movement describes everything from uh, a closely held personal belief you've never told anyone to things like Buddhism or the Catholic Church. There's a wide range of things here, mm-hmm. but still, it it is there and it's and it's present. So now we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is he teaching? From from the article, uh, Schofield describes it thusly. A mashup of Advaita Vedanta and the Law of Attraction. Other influences include Osho, Bashar, the Law of One channeled by Ra, Nisargadatta Maharaj, and some yogic text as well. So there's a lot of stuff in the mix. Yeah. Yeah, and the Advaita Vedanta um, school is a particular type of Hindu philosophy and a, cl- a path to spiritual realization. It focuses on um, the teachings of the Upanishads and finding basically the highest levels of metaphysical reality, mm-hmm. which is a Brahman or sort of something like achieving nirvana. Mm-hmm. Um, and... More interestingly to me is this idea of the law of one, which is something I'd never heard before. And I found a page, uh, lawofone.info, that goes through the different levels of enlightenment that one can achieve by following this path. Uh, and I'm going to read a little bit from that. Um, the law of one states that there is only one, and that one is the infinite creator. Uh, it also invokes the name of Ra, uh, the Egyptian god, Um Ra also calls infinite intelligence and intelligent infinity. It's impossible to describe the one undifferentiated intelligent infinity, unpolarized, full and whole, but it can be activated or potentiated. Each portion of the creation contains paradoxically the whole. Ah, oh, it is like an ocean. Well, it's, it's hologrammatic thinking as well. And there is a book called The Raw Material. Huh? Get it? Yeah. Uh, an ancient astronaut speaks... Uh, the Law of One by a man by the name of Don Elkins. And the um, synopsis for that on Amazon is pretty interesting. It poses a few questions. What are the ancient astronauts? Why did they first come to Earth? Why are they returning now? What part did they play in building the great monuments of antiquity? Uh, what part did they play in the formation of present and earlier civilizations? With what other beings do we share our universe? And where does the Earth fit into the cosmic scheme of things? Almost 20 years of experimental work with telepathy led to the breakthrough contact recorded in this book, The Raw Material, as an account, not only for the events leading up to this contact, but of over 200 pages of verbatim transcripts of each and every conversation. Two things, real quick. Yeah. Noel, I swear you have heard this concept before but it was packaged very differently Mm -hmm. you're a bill hicks fan right sure bill hicks talks about this sort of thing he probably got it from uh, a a very similar um he probably got it from his very similar source maybe even the upanishads he he was a constant reader it's interesting the second thing that's really interesting about this is what we're seeing is syncretism, combining of aspects mm-hmm. from different religions. And Vedanta itself is kind of syncretic. So we're seeing a, and I don't want to say a mixtape of a mixtape because I don't want to be dismissive, but we're seeing like combinations of combinations coming through, which honestly I applaud. If we're talking about spirituality, I really feel like you should find what works for you. A little later, we're going to get into a direct message from Bentinho Massaro. And it, it says that very thing that you're talking about, Ben, where he, his teachings over time, he says, have been a collection of different teachings and different movements and all these paradoxical, even at times things. It seems less about worshiping a God too, as much as it is kind of treating yourself as a God or an mm-hmm. extension of the universe. And it's interesting because the law of one has these, these layers, almost Scientology esque layers. They're called densities and it's first through eighth density. And it's something uh, that Masaru touches a lot. In the teachings. Absolutely. He definitely talks about it. And it's, it's, it's a little hard to wrap your head around. And I think for good reason, just to read a couple of these, I'll, I'll do the first and the last. The first density is the density of awareness in which the planet moves out of the timeless state into physical manifestation. Its elements are earth, air, water, and fire on earth after matter had coalesced and space time had begun to quote, unroll its scroll of livingness. First density took about 2 billion years. Then eighth density 
is also the beginning of the first density of the next creation. It is both omega and alpha, the spiritual mass of the infinite universes becoming one central sun or creator once again. Then is born a new universe, a new infinity, a new logos, which incorporates all that the creator has experienced of itself. So what this sounds like to me is essentially the Big Bang they're describing in the first density, right? After after the Big Bang has occurred and now we actually have an Earth, we have a place where consciousness can exist. Mm-hmm. Then going through all these other densities through here to getting to the eighth density is when it's snapped back together, essentially, if you look at um, some of the – there are infinite universe models mm-hmm. that believe Big Bangs – occur as an expansion and then there's a collapsing back down into essentially one singularity and then another expansion and then it just continues on this cycle. Cycle of contraction and expansion. And that's and one model. That's one model. And then also this has a lot in common with um, the views of alchemical experts, right? Mm-hmm. Or alchemical scholars in the great work. This is not – the. I think the point we're making is this is not by any means a new idea but – also, in Masaru's defense, he's not really saying it's a new idea either. Correct. Right? And uh, it would be it would be unfair of us to say that he thinks he discovered it. He does believe that he put it all together in the right way, but he doesn't claim that he did everything. Mm-hmm. Another another interesting part about this in the digital age is that a lot of his teachings or courses or videos or lessons or talks have um a quantifiable aspect to them. It's not just reach level, you know, reach this density, density X or whatever. It's how to reach it in X amount of steps, how to understand concept A in Y amount of time. And this clicks with a lot of people in today's age where we want to we have so many things to pay attention to or spend time on that we want to know about how long it's going to take or how to measure our steps to success as appealing as sitting under a tree for an indeterminate length of time to reach enlightenment may sound in theory very few people are doing it in practice or fewer now you can even see it in the furniture a lot of us choose to purchase (laughs) <laughs> if you if you imagine like getting just some wood and making a table or you could get the IKEA one that has a, a a list of steps to follow and then you got yourself a table man and this kind of results based quick results based attitude really plays into that kind of uh you know lightning fast communication everyone's attention span is shorter than it's ever been we want everything in blurbs and nuggets and like give it to us quick even his videos he's got longer videos but a lot of them are distilled down into like 10 or 12 minutes little sound bites that are easier to digest for folks so he's very much aware of his audience i would say uh they are not easy to understand at least as a layperson who has not taken all the courses Yet I've attempted to watch six videos today. Again, like rewatching videos to just understand some of the density stuff. To understand uh, taking two to five seconds uh, out of every like X seconds, mm-hmm. and, and the I don't understand a lot of the messages. Well, let me rephrase. I, I don't either. I guess all I'm saying is that I'm at least able to watch. Uh, 10 minutes of this stuff rather than, you know, two hours. Right. And it's interesting because Masaro's followers themselves, a lot of them, uh, we found some, there's a SoundCloud page uh, from Batgirl that interviews some uh, folks from some of these conferences. Um, they say that it's totally fine to not understand what the hell he's talking about. The message, they say, is between the words. And that's another thing you see with gurus or enlightened masters throughout human history. There's this idea that the leader functions as sort of an antagonistic Rorschach inkblot. Mm -hmm. You see what you want to see and hear what you want to hear. And you're always bad. You're always wrong unless you're no longer you. We'll be back after a word from our sponsor. So, Masaru speaks often about interpreting vibrations, what he would term as vibrations. His followers claim to be able to interpret and internalize the vibrations he puts out, and they feel that a lot of the content or the message or the enlightenment that he is conveying comes from these vibrations, more so than maybe the actual words. And this quote should be on the jacket of of his first book. It is, 
You are a vibrator. And you are a vibrator. And, and you, you are, are a vibrator. vibrator. Okay, no, that is that is a, uh, a verbatim quote there. If but he said that to me, I'd slug him. <laughs> well, well, in a way, he's kind of right, guys. All of our energy just is just vibrating. It's true. Physical matter is relatively illusory. Uh, can, we, can we talk a little bit about Sedona and just the scene in Sedona? Like, not with too much detail, but just in case anyone's not familiar, and I really wish I'd had a chance to talk to our coworker Julie Douglas, who just did kind of a tour of that part of the country, but Sedona, Arizona, is kind of ground zero for a lot of this new age teachings and self betterment through self-actualization and yoga, and there are all of these different retreats, and it is a, a really rife uh, with these kinds of gurus. And what makes it interesting to us is that it, it feels like um, a new approach to this kind of thinking or the, mm-hmm. this kind of um, recruitment or I, I, I'm it's, not sure. It's a it's an amalgamation of startup culture, which leads to that other thing, right, is what's the difference between startup culture and what's the difference between, you know, an old school cult because yeah. we do have in startup cultures we see this sent up in so many satirical pieces like silicon valley or something uh we see these commonalities there is a a cult of personality right mm-hmm. and there is a um there is a drive to dedicate oneself entirely to a cause yeah whether it's making the you know newest app to hand deliver bags of artisanal badgers to people <laughs> or you know or whether it's to figure out a way to have a a drone that will uh, i don't know bring you shoes and pizza and pizza you bring know you shoes and pizza <laughs> and like the best startups they begin with a product that, that's kind of tangible you can get like ben, bentinho's teachings and the videos but then there's this much larger goal like you said ben Oh, it's down the road. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned this. Yes, because Masaro's Trinfinity, which, which Noel introduced earlier, is a step in a larger plan. And his seminars and his speeches are part of a much larger goal, a four-phase plan to create an enlightened society by 2035. So not that far down the 100%, road. 100%. 100% enlightened. Right. Let's right. hear from the man himself. With the work that I'm doing, what I'm trying to achieve, quite frankly, is uh, to have a 100% enlightened civilization by 2035, to make it specific. Um, so that gives us 20 years to, um, to share this message in, in many different kinds of ways, not just educational ways, but also in terms of products, inventions, technology, uh, and education, obviously, so that everyone can start to act on their inspiration and be guided by that higher intelligence which sticks in our heart in the sense of a passion and excitement and inspiration. When the whole world starts to listen to that impulse and be aware of the fact that they are already free beings, that they're already awake, powerful beings, then the world would be an amazing place to be. So steps along the way in this plan include the creation of apps, uh, film, TV, and record studios, uh, VR technology, an astral projection inducer. What? Yeah, a couple of labs. And, you know, you could, you could ask yourself, is that astral projection inducer encouraging lucid dreams? Yeah. Or is it real remote viewing? The U.S. government did work on <laughs> remote viewing for a long time. That is true. Uh, publishing. Not reliable. Uh, we have an episode on it, I think. Don't we? <laughs> we do. We want to interview one of those guys one day. So if you're listening, Hit us up, or you might be in the room now. <gasps> but they also have, uh, interestingly, a system to foster open contact with aliens. This all culminates in the construction of something called Trinfinity City, a metropolis built in hopes of being prepared for open interstellar contact in contrast to the clandestine contact that Masaru believes has occurred in the past. That might sound controversial, but he has plenty of beliefs that might seem controversial to the mainstream. I wonder if he and Stephen Greer have ever gotten together because, you know, Stephen Greer's The Encounter of the Fifth Kind is all about contacting aliens through meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also about, you know, getting gullible rich people to drop mad cash to go on these excursions. Burn. You have to wonder, though, you know, from from what we could hear, uh, Masaro has been controversial with 
other teachers, other mm. like other spiritual teachers. Uh, we have examples of that. So I, I could see him also being controversial with other secular leaders of movements mm. as well. And we have to give serious credit to B. Schofield again for this Medium article. It is very, very in-depth, um, and I recommend you guys seeking it out. There are clips, there are videos, there are audio samples, all kinds of stuff, because she actually embedded herself in one of his groups under an assumed name. Um, and, you know, we'll get to this a little later, but the Trinfinity folks and Bentinho uh, did publish a response um, to this article. Um, but in the article, she talks about the fact that in his early days, he was invited to be part of a uh, a collection of speakers um, by a group called Sounds True, which I think is a really funny name for an organization like this. Like, well, it sounds true. I yeah. guess it might, must be true. It's like a spiritual symposium. Spiritual symposium, but I just feel like it's a, it's a little, the, the name is, is almost, sounds, sounds a little jokey to me. But, um, he, some of the other speakers, you might have heard of Eckhart Tolle, who is, is much beloved. And I know people who, who I find be completely rational, intelligent people that are really into his stuff. Um, but he kind of wanted to distance himself from these types of folks and just sort of, talked a lot of trash and really did not want to be associated with them anymore after this first uh, symposium that he was a part of and wanted to kind of go out on his own and make it all about him and his specific teachings and not have to answer to anyone else's worldview. And sounds a little cult leaderish to me. Yeah. Well, maybe it's just the, the question is always, do these people genuinely believe this stuff or is it sort of a flim flam show? Are they, are they, objecting to the views of another spiritual leader because they feel that those views are business competition or are they objecting because they honestly believe it's wrong, you know? Yeah. And that's a question that's tough to answer. But we, we do know that, um, we do know that he has several beliefs that would be considered controversial, not just, not just controversial amongst, uh, spiritual peers, which of course he and his followers believe he has none, but not just in the sphere of the spiritual, but in the secular sphere as well. One of the big ones is suppressed technology, which for the record, I'm not, to, I'm not going out of my way to unfairly defend someone that I've never met. We do know suppressed technology exists. Sure. We just, we're, now we're just as a, species arguing about the degree of suppression. Yeah, in Bentinho's mind, we're decades, if not centuries, behind with the the known technology to the average consumer. Let's let's read a quote here. We have bases on the moon, a bunch of slave colonies on Mars that have been mining the asteroid belt. We have been colonizing galaxies of our solar system. We haven't needed fossil fuels for the last eighty years because we have anti-gravic mechanisms. The Nazis won the war. The U.S. government gave up their control, their governance, so we would not be exposed to free energy devices. If free energy gets released, and we're working on it, he's referring to Trinfinity Corp., it changes everything. We've had free energy for 80 f***ing years. That is a direct quote. Also, uh, Masaro absolutely believes in aliens, by which we mean extraterrestrials. Another quote would be, don't be surprised that the aliens will meet and we will meet them look like the things you see in movies. Don't be like, oh, this story of this guy is nonsense because I've seen that in the movies. He just got it from the movies. Well, did he get it from the movies or did the movies get it from them? And this ties into a belief that we've we've touched on in the past where you'll see people arguing that there is a large – and largely hidden movement in pop culture to acclimatize the general public with the idea of extraterrestrials by making them a familiar trope in fiction. But the issue for, for me here is there's no evidence. This isn't evidence-based claims at all. It's it's just stuff that, that he says, taken at face value. Um, and, you know, it goes so far as to say things. We talked about those density levels. Um, apparently... Um, he and his followers, and he also has a, a very close team that he keeps around him. Um, talk about folks like Buddha and Jesus being sixth, maybe seventh density. Um, and again, this is from the Medium article. And that's the density of unity, by the way. The density of unity, exactly. But that Bentinho 
is at eighth. He just blows all of those other spiritual leaders out of the water. That's not even on the thing. No, it is. It is. Eighth is the new coming. It's, yeah. it's him. And that, that's one of the, one of the, um, errors that Masaru points out about Jesus Christ is that Jesus, he says, is pretty much well and good, did some good stuff. Uh, I think he called him a fabulous person, but he claimed he was the son of God and not a God. Hmm. So it's a differentiation there. And the, the density stuff that Trinfinity ascribes to as an organization does have, you know, the one to seven densities with the eighth density being, as Matt said, forthcoming. You're probably wondering how far this goes, folks. Uh, there are claims of extraordinary powers as well. In several of his videos, Masaru claims to have supernatural powers that have come easily to him, uh, but there are reasons why he doesn't use them all the time. He says, it's not more important that I'm able to teleport and bilocate and levitate and move mountains at will. That's not what's most important to me because my soul knows that's easy. It's not hard at all. It's absolutely easy. So one of these powers would be weather control. Several of his followers claim he has the ability to control weather to a degree, specifically uh, stories about dispersing clouds before they cause uh, inclement weather or storms, similar to... Um, William Reich attempting to bust clouds with orgone energy, but without the mechanisms or the, the artifacts that Reich built. There's a quote from one of his followers that we found that says, I've watched him control the weather a lot of times. We'll be at a party and I'll be like, Bentinho, these clouds are not good. It looks like rain. Within 10 minutes, they're gone. He does it all the time. I've watched him move objects on tables. I've seen him multiple times change weather or move clouds. Of course, it's telekinesis also in there. Yep. Mm -hmm. The ability to move objects specifically at a table without physically touching them. Um, magicians and skeptics in the crowd, I am sure that you know the numerous ways in which people can create things that appear to be that effect. I'm not saying that Masaro is purpose again i'm not saying masaru is purposely misleading people but i'm saying between uh between physical manipulation and between credulous observers yeah. it's very possible for somebody to mistake something kind of mundane for something like telekinesis I think the next two are really interesting because they are attributes often ascribed in Catholic doctrine to saints and religious mm -hmm. figures. So we've got something called bilocation. Um, and what that is, is the supposed phenomenon of an individual being able to be in two physical locations at the same time. Um, you, it's kind. This isn't exactly the same thing, but it's kind of like in the Catholic Eucharist, um, the concept of transubstantiation, where supposedly the bread and the wine that you partake of actually transforms physically into the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. But more specifically, a really interesting example of this is uh, from a man by the name of Padre Pio, who lived from 1887 to 1968, was an Italian friar, a Capuchin priest. Um, he suffered from stigmata wounds and. And he was ultimately made a saint and was said to possess the power of bilocation. Let's tell this quick story. Um, as a seminary student, he claims to have teleported during prayer to the home of a wealthy couple where he witnessed a woman giving birth to a child, uh, a daughter. Um, all the while, her husband lay dying. Uh, he claims the Virgin Mary appeared to him, told him she was entrusting this newborn child to him and that he should take care of her. Pio asked how he would know her and was told that she'd find him first and they'd meet in Rome. Um, then it said the mother saw him leaving the room. So supposedly the daughter gave confession to Pio 17 years later in St. Peter's Basilica in Rome and that he took her in and took care of her physically and spiritually a year later. Hmm, 17-year-old girl. Often conflated with or closely related with the concept of clairvoyance, which is not telling the future. It's realizing events that have transpired in a way that would not normally be observable. So it's sort of sending your mind or your awareness to something. Bilocation is different. Bilocation is appearing, yes. right? Either appearing in some sort of intangible but visible form or appearing in a legitimate 
physical substance. So Masaru says he, he can do this, but says it's not really the point of his mission or his existence here on this yeah. plane. He also says it's easy. Oh, it's so easy. I can bilocate. Well, he doesn't, from his perspective, he doesn't want it to distract from his actual calling. Sort of the same way that Anthony Hopkins doesn't want, you know, like Anthony Hopkins is acting and he's an amazing actor, but his first love is piano and that's why he feels like he's here on earth. Masaru actually claims to be purposely blocking these abilities because they are not what he wants to be known for. And his followers um, often say that, like with that quote, that they have seen him do some of these, I'm going to call them miracles. Um, but never does he offer to demonstrate them in any of his dozens and dozens of YouTube videos. Well, you know, if they're really on that plan to, by 2035, have a 100 percent enlightened society, what's going to have to happen is – Bentinho is going to have to teleport, which is the next thing we're going to talk about, in one of his YouTube videos somehow or in public somewhere where people have cameras on him. And then that's when he starts getting 300 million followers, Mm -hmm. 400 million followers. Then he can really start changing society. So at this point, what we have described are the aims of the organization, a brief description of Masar himself. And we didn't, we didn't talk about his childhood. We didn't talk about some of the criticisms of his personality that you could, you could read at length and please, you know, read them with a grain of salt because we have to wonder what the motivations of the people might be. Sure. That's, that's being fair. Uh, but we do know that former core staff members have talked about darker sides of this. One said, I feel he is setting people up for mass suicide. He talked about the harvest. I always had a weird feeling about this. And on December 9th, I want to say 2017, one of Masaru's longtime devoted students, a fellow named Brent Wilkins, committed suicide by jumping off a cliff near the Migley Bridge in Sedona, Arizona. And you can see news stories about it. You can see some, I don't know, some different media mentions. But the thing is that for people who are opponents of this guy or this this movement, this budding movement, this is taken to be a sign that something is woefully rotten in the town of Sedona. However, to be fair, it is, you know, it's, it's difficult to ascribe the exact cause for that suicide without more information. Every suicide is a tragedy. And it may be that Mr. Wilkins was troubled for other reasons unrelated to his involvement in the movement. But the reason this thing becomes disturbing to people whether they consider themselves neutral observers or whether they consider themselves uh, already prejudiced observers, the troubling thing with this is that if is that we have seen precedents before in mm-hmm. the United States. The United States is um, a hotbed of movements that, for one reason or another, go sour. I personally do not think it is fair, nor do I think it is productive to call a a leader of a YouTube movement a new Jim Jones or a new David Koresh or a new Charles Manson because at this point, thank God, no one has been murdered, right? But we would be remiss if we did not mention that that suicide occurred. And we would also be remiss if we didn't mention this harvest concept. And what, what is it? Is it a, um, is it supposed to be a massive spiritual awakening and ascension of the group? Yeah. It, it's weird when you, when you put whatever concept the harvest is and you line it up with that enlightened society by 2035 goal. And like, what is that? What, is that what the harvest is? Like by harvesting all of the egos? Maybe so that we're all enlightened. Maybe that's what he's talking about. But that's just me thinking on the top of my head. He did post on his Instagram page an excerpt from a book about a uh, a yogi by the name of Saradama. Um, and in it, it says, whatever the guru does is correct. The guru is the self and he cannot do wrong, even though his actions may well appear to be wrong in the sight of the world. If a devotee sees the guru's actions as bad and thinks badly of the guru, bad power will come to the devotee. If you think that whatever the guru does is correct, then good power will come. So this is almost Nietzschean and it's beyond good and evil 
idea. There's also uh, there's there's also a quote from an ex member named Gabby Petrus who was able to go on record with their name. Uh, according to Petrus, Masaru predicts planet Earth is at the crossroads of splitting into two planes of existence: high vibration fourth dimensional beings who embody love as do his students, will ascend to a less physical realm featuring telepathic group consciousness, low-vibration, third-dimensional beings. That's you, me, and Paul. No, mm-hmm. no that Matt's a cloud. Low-vibration, third-dimensional beings who embody negativity are on a, quote, ship going down. So there's nothing specific or physical here, right? I think that's very important. There's no prediction of an imminent physical apocalyptic event. However, for people who, again, are reading into this, there seems to be a dark disturbance. And this is so new that we, you know, we're, we're reporting on something that is happening now. It's yeah. quite possible that it changes in the future and we have to update it. For me, though, the thing that's, that's striking about this, this guy is, you know, when you think of, a true guru or a true leader, often they eschew material things. But if you check out this guy's Instagram, he is a big time all about material things. Baller. He has, you know, rented million dollar mansions and is, you know, constantly taking selfies, smoking fine cigars and posing shirtless in the mirror. I mean, he is clearly quite into himself and not to say there's anything wrong with that. And in fact, part of his rhetoric is that that is okay and that that's a part of it. You are a god. You know, you are the best version of yourself you should be this kind of hedonism the idea of sort of pursuing your bliss i guess but it just doesn't quite jive with his you know sort of self-actualization kind of mm-hmm. well, rhetoric it, but it actually it actually it, it jives perfectly really Give and I, i'll tell you why there is a video on there on the trinfinity page called meet bentino masaro a spiritual teacher for the next generation here is a quote from that video, and it's Bentino talking. After, after it has him like a setup to the video, then it has a long montage of like a, a dance party rave kind of thing in the middle of wherever it is that they're having this talk. A long like slow motion dance party. Then it cuts back to Bentino, and he says this. Technically, feeling good is your only job, because when you feel good, literally everything else takes care of itself. Now, this doesn't mean that we don't take action. We don't act on our visions. It simply means that without feeling good first, you're not even in the same wave, wavelength as inspiration. You cannot get access to thoughts that offer solutions instead of problems, joy instead of depression. So in order to be in the proper state, all you have to do is be in the moment, tune into yourself, and ask yourself intuitively what is the most exciting thing I could be thinking of or doing right now? So I think for me, that's that perfect perfectly embodies smoking a fine cigar, hanging out at a mansion, using uh, the money that I got from these donations. Sure. I'm doing what's making me happy right now. And yet what? he pushes fasting on his followers where he says they can only drink grape juice and shouldn't eat any food or water. It just, it just kind of feels like the rules don't apply to him. I, that's all I'm saying. It's really important that I put this in here uh, because – Gosh knows, folks, as you're listening, you're wondering why one of us doesn't say this. This is spot on with L. Ron Hubbard, a.k.a. the Commodore in Mm. Scientology. This is spot on with the pigs in Animal Farm. There is a very – it's very – there is a convenience of equality, equality for me because I get it. Because yes. I'm in on it, that's why I'm in charge, right? And the people who are in the fasting programs are not experiencing this kind of joy. What they're experiencing are uh, chronic health problems. Their teeth are falling out. Their hair is falling out. And this is similar to things you'll hear like the um, Scientology's infamous niacin treatments. Yeah, or the whole. Or the whole, right? Uh, so we we want to be – we want to be as fair as possible with this, but that is that is paradoxical, and it does yeah. stick out. And paradoxical is a word that Masaru uses in his own defense because, as we mentioned earlier at the top of the show, uh, we we felt it necessary to give you uh, a couple excerpts from Trinfinity's reply 
to this article. The blog post was called Our First Official Response to the Cult Accusations. Quote, at some point, something like this was going to arise. It always does for people in my community. I encourage you to exhibit no anger or judgment towards the author. That's nice. You could pick the most saintly figures in history, and if you really wanted to, you could pick them apart and reassemble them to meet any agenda you may have in how you wish to think of them. There's an important part there, too, where they say the author of this article was out to create a false sensationalist piece and my transparency and paradoxical eh, but innocent expressions over the years made this an easy picture for her to paint. Uh, It says, I am not an abuser and I am not out to gain power over others, but decide for yourself. If I have any upset over this, it is for the people who have put in tremendous effort and commitment to applying the work and elevating their lives and are now left represented as people who have no ability to discern and are lost in their following of me. And then he goes on to say that calling it a cult is quite an assertion to make and honors no one. Uh, there is ever so much more to an entity than meets the eye. This is part of the message I wish to embody through my occasionally paradoxical appearances. Never judge the service of any situation, person, person. Or motivation. In fact, never judge at all. See beyond the surface and be free. Be love. And I do want to say, too, that in um, with the SoundCloud page uh, from Batgirl that you can find, um, there's an interview with one of the followers, and the person very casually asks how they feel about being referred to as a cult. And the person says, well, if it's a cult, it's a cult I want to be in. Uh, yeah, so, you know, yeah. there's that. There, that there is a lot of positivity that you will see. At least, again, I'm not. I'm trying not to judge them on the surface, but on the surface, there seems to be a ton of positivity. Sure, yeah, um, and things that you would want to take away that feel good, like that when we were talking about, you know, uh, find joy mm. and pursue joy, and everything else is going to fall into place. That sounds great. Yeah. But what, how do we define joy? A great deal of human tragedy is people selfishly pursuing something that brings joy to them at the expense and the physical, emotional danger of others. People are selfish dicks. Yeah. It's true. And this leads us to some questions. It's, it's a shame there's a lot of stuff we didn't get to today, folks. But we're running a little long, yeah. so we may have to come back for an update. As we said, this this is developing. We hope that we have fairly represented both the concerns and the claims in in yeah. here. Yeah. So as Matt said, not to judge at the surface, but these things sound inspiring, hopeful, and even attainable. And uh, Matt, you uh, you dropped a quote here in the notes that I want to give you the honor of. Oh, yeah. Well, basically what he's saying is let your passion guide you. Follow your dreams, right? Uh, for some people, it means I'll finally make that podcast about badger bags that I've been talking about for the last two years. For others, it means I will become the next top chef. I feel like you, you took an indirect shot at me there, buddy. Oh, the, the badger bags <laughs> podcast? I, it's coming, man. And I think you can follow your passion one day and you're going to be able to do it. I believe uh, <laughs> in the both of you, even you in your current gaseous state. Oh, thank you so much. But, but the question I want to leave here is with these kinds of teachings, they are very positive for somebody who has an aspiration that is positive for other people or even for themselves, but it's not going to harm anybody else. What if somebody's joy that they're really following, kind of the point that Ben made earlier, uh, what if their joy is harming other people? What if they're the most exciting thing they could be doing right now is a brutal crime? Have you guys heard of McKamey Manor? No. M A N O R, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like a extreme haunted house that was in San Diego for oh, a long yes. time, where okay. they like kidnap you and and shave brutalize you and shave your head and force feed you horrible things. This is a really extreme example, but the guy that runs it, his last name is McCamey, Um He videos everything. Yeah. Everyone that comes in there, they all come in there willingly, right? Sign a, they a sign waiver, a waiver that, that totally signs away all their rights to sue. There's no safe word. You're in there until he's done with you. Ugh. And he's up in your face the whole time, you know, getting footage of you being brutalized and tortured. And some people sign up and come back and do it again. I'm not saying that is directly what this is like, but it's sort of an extreme example that I think warrants comparison. Because like you're saying, if... People will willingly submit to something that is not ultimately good for them, 
right? Mm-hmm. Sure. And especially given the promise of uh, something new, you know, something different. Something beyond. Something that is beyond. not understandable. Like the same reason people open the Lemakand uh, configuration in Hellraiser. Exactly. Right? Pushing yourself as far as possible, whether spiritually or physically. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, we know that uh, for many people – Many, for many people, joy, emotions in general are complex, often difficult to discern things. We have questions for you as well. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Do you think, what's your take on these sorts of movements and how they exist in the digital age? Are they uh, a harmless new iteration of some tale as old as time to steal the line from Beauty and the Beast? Is there something new? That's uh, fundamentally changing them? And if so, how? Is it for the better? Is it for the worse? Is it dangerous? Do you consider this movement and things like it a a cult, as our author B. Schofield clearly does? And this is one I really want to know. Do you have any other examples for us? Mm -hmm. And also, have you been to a Masaro retreat or maybe been to a talk or, you know, and you feel like you've come out with something positive Mm -hmm. and... You're okay with everything. Is the author being unfair? Yeah. Are we being unfair? Let us know. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.